All right, everyone. It's Friday, and you know what that means. That means the Manufacturing E-Commerce Success Series. I'm one of your co-hosts, Damon Pasolka. That good-looking guy right over there. The tsunami on two legs. <laughs> Kurt Anderson, co-host. Take it away, Kurt. Damon, dude, thank you, brother. I, I how was your Valentine's Day? I see like you guys both have red. Was it good Valentine's Day this week? How awesome. was Damon? Did, awesome. did you okay? Awesome. We'll, we'll you know what we'll talk about. How, I want to make sure that you you know. I got to talk to Lene, your wonderful, amazing, beautiful wife. Make sure you t okay. So anyway, let's get back on track. Damon, I am totally starstruck today. We have a powerhouse. Yes, we do. In the house, we have my dear friend Darcy Eichenberg. Darcy, happy Friday. How are you? Happy Friday to everybody and happy belated Valentine's Day. Yes, I wore my put my red cape on for you and show you my heart today. <laughs> the red cape revolution is happening yeah. right here as we speak, guys. So, hey, happy Friday, everybody. Hope you had an amazing, wonderful, incredible week. And boy, please sit back. We have this is going to be a fun filled program. Drop a note in the chat box. Let us know that you're out there. Give Darcy a big hello. We would encourage you, invite you, welcome you. You absolutely want to connect with Darcy here on LinkedIn. So Darcy, you've had just an amazing, incredible career. You worked at like really small, or you know, worked with small companies like Coca-Cola, Aon, these little, little tiny things. Yeah. But before I get into this wonderful career and this red cape that you fly and how you're helping people all over the country with their careers, I have a question for you. As a little girl growing up, who was your hero? Who was your hero as a little girl growing up? Yeah, I think as a girl growing up, it was my dad. No. Um, the, and I know you're a girl dad too, right? You know, so uh, my dad, uh, from New York to a very small town in central Illinois, where he was going to be the head of a, of a factory that happened to just be there. They had no relatives there. They had no friends there. And, um, you know, my dad was the person that I studied and role modeled. You know, he he uh, worked hard, cared about his people, uh, didn't always have it easy, made mistakes. Uh, and, you know, in hindsight, I think we can also see more of those things when our parents were superhuman. But yeah, yeah. and my dad came from a family where, you know, his dad, uh, who probably was the second in line, and I, I fought with them both in my brain when you asked that question, you know, my grandfather didn't didn't go to high school and went to work for, in the factory when his dad died and there were seven kids to feed and worked his way up to being chairman of the board of a major company. Wow. And, you know, those, those kind of stories, um, I think we we overlook some of those stories today and they're very inspiring and they continue to inspire me. So, yeah. So uh, my dad and his dad before him were probably, you know, my heroes when I was growing up. Well, as two girl dads here, that warms our yeah. heart and what's what's dad's name jack yeah so big shout out to jack and i uh, boy said he is he's since passed and on an, another plane but i i talk to him all the time so i think he's, he's watching so. well i'm sure he's absolutely watching we are sending our thoughts and our prayers to dad jack who's watching down on his little baby girl here who's just absolutely doing an amazing job and so hey it, it, we've got some great chat going on in the yeah, chat box on. Tina is here, our dear, our fellow mastermind. Tina, thank you. She says her dad's a hero. Snia is here. Snia is going to be coming on the program a couple months, Damon. We've got Whitney. We've got all sorts of folks. So again, guys, drop a note in the chat box. Let us know you're out there. But if you have questions, this, this is the time. We've got Coach Darage, and again, she is a powerhouse. Darcy, I want to stick with this for a minute. Okay. So dad, Jack is your superhero and just, and you shared a great story, you know, about manufacturing, being on a uh, shop floor. Yeah. What, how inspiring they moved to a community and know nobody. Talk a little bit about man, what manufacturing meant to you, your family, and how like it really elevated you to the career that you have today. Yeah. So, so, so I mentioned my, you know, my grandfather went to work for a company that later became Revere Copper and Brass that mm -hmm. people would, uh, you know, later know for pots and pans and the copper mm -hmm. bottom pans. 
And, um, you know, after college, my dad also went to work for, you know, for that company. But being the first college educated person in the family, he was able to work his way into different types of roles. And when they were opening a new plant in a small town in central Illinois, yeah. uh, he got the tap on the shoulder to go out and, and, and run it and put it together. And, um, you know, and I remember, so I was born there. So I wasn't born in New York where the major, major factories were and where yeah. uh, the work had originated. Yeah. And so, you know, what I saw is we, we would go, you know, we would go to the plant on a Saturday morning yes. and, you know, we'd walk through the plant and I could see all the equipment and kind of, you know, see the remnants of, you know, life on the factory floor. And I remember picking up, uh, you know, little stamped pieces of, of, of metal, you know, to play with from time to time. It's all safe. Of course, these were yeah. before there probably were more protections <laughs> yeah. back in the 70s. Yeah. Right, 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 before but, that. But I, I knew how important the you know, not only the end product, because we all have the end product in our homes, right? And, um, you know, having a, a Revere tea kettle or Revere pot and pan and seeing the stamp on the bottom that said Clinton, Illinois, um, and knowing that, like, my friends and my family, you know, like my friends, their their parents work there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't until I was later that I understood all the different types of roles and, and, uh, and that even what my dad really did. Um, and so, but, you know, I have such a respect. We used to joke that, you know, I go to bed, say my prayers, you know, God bless mommy, God bless daddy and God bless Revere, you know, the company yeah. is part yeah. of your life. Yeah. So I think it's so important that as we have our manufacturing jobs and we want to keep manufacturing jobs and grow, grow manufacturing in this country, right. that right. we really want to make sure that you know, people are connected to the work and that the work is actually meaningful um, because it's meaningful in the community. It's meaningful in families, as well as for all the customers that those companies serve. Man, I absolutely love that. I can't remember. I, somebody I just the other day, like when you talk about a small community, like what manufacturing does for a community, like you don't hear about like, oh, it's an accounting firm community or the law firm community like it's a you know a one factory town or like this manufacturer did this for a community so darcy I absolutely love what you're saying and you talk about like that american dream and you look at the yeah. career that you just really have blossomed now i know being in illinois you are a, a northwestern grad if i'm not mistaken now damon you know i I don't know if you know this. I'll, I'm a little cat out of the bag. I applied to Northwestern, but I messed up. I had the wrong direction. I was going Southeastern, but I, you know, but anyway, they wouldn't let me in. Darcy, you went to Northwestern, a great prestigious college, wonderful university. Share like how, what was your career path of leaving high school, going to Northwestern? Did you see yourself where you are now? Like, what did that look like when you're back in a wildcat back at Northwestern? Uh, does anybody see themselves where they are now? I mean, I think our careers are always created in reverse, right? And this, you know, it's something I wish I could like insert a chip into every college student yeah, or high school right. student right now to let them know that you know, three quarters of the worry that they have about the future, they should let go because yeah. because all you can do is follow the next rock that is on in front of you on the stream, and sometimes you stretch to the right. And, you know, you step on a big rock and sometimes you balance to the left and you step on a little rock. But, you know, you just have to keep moving forward. So for me, uh, I went to Northwestern at, in Medill, the journalism program. Nice. And after the first year of of the program where, you know, a lot of what was being trained at the time was very straight up, you know, traditional journalism, uh, you know, who, what, where, when, how, uh, and, um, that kind of bored me. I didn't see myself, you know, on the international desk for the New York times or writing business news for the wall street journal. And so I transferred into what is, was called the school of speech, the school of communication for a more broader education. And wouldn't, you know, the first job that I got out of college was as a reporter, but it was for a, a advertising trade magazine, with a world that I never knew existed. That, oh, wait, there's these other places you can write that, that aren't just, uh, you know, the, the obituaries and traditional. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. So, uh, so that's kind of how I got started into more content development and understanding advertising and marketing. And that led me to explore change management and behavior. And that's sort of been a theme through all of my career. Well, I absolutely love it. I see our buddy Michael Regal's here. And again, yep. guys, drop a note in the chat box. Let us know that you're here. I see. I think Tina's got a question. And I'm going to Yeah, she does. Right. We'll hit that in just a moment. We'll, we'll hit that in one second because I don't want to lose that in the chat, Tina. So yep. hang on one second. But what I want, you know, Red Cape Revolution, I absolutely love when you and I first connected. I mean, like that just stood out. I It was with your brand. I knew you just absolutely loved where you went there. Was there a point in your young career, early career? When did it hit you? Was there an aha moment where you're like, you know what? I feel I have like a God-given talent of helping people with the, you know, being a change agent or just, you know, just you have rave reviews on the work that you're doing and you're cha- like, you're truly changing lives. When was there a moment where you're like, I think I'm onto something. I'm going to go this direction. Do you remember that time or was it gradual? What did that look like? Well, so you're again, really generous in creating my history and, you know, <laughs> looking back as opposed to looking forward. Um, and quite honestly, uh, because, you know, I grew up in a family that was a, uh, company family right and i um you know after a few jobs early on um i eventually joined a firm a a large consulting firm and uh, you know i thought that was where i was going to be you know that i was a lifer and i and I, you know, I love the work we did at the firm. Um, It gave me exposure to lots of different companies. I had the great fortune to kind of peek inside and behind the curtain for lots of big name companies. And I worked with a group of very high performing, uh, you know, people and very caring. And it was a company that was fast growing. And so I got a lot of opportunities really quickly and I became a partner and, you know, it was, I was there for 15 years. And I think most people would say that uh, they would have assumed I was a lifer, but you know, like many people, there's a point as to where you keep growing and growing and growing. And then the next place up, you look at it and say, that's the place that I want. And for me, I tell this story in the book where it actually um, was, I was on my way to a leadership team meeting that was in Chicago. I was coming from Atlanta where I was at the time. It was February, it was cold. And I was in a rental car and and trying to reach me. This is before we were Bluetooth and we could yeah. talk and drive at the same time. I'm not really talented at that even now, but uh so I pulled over into a McDonald's parking lot to take to take her call. And I remember how cold it was. And she told me that she was going to retire. And in that second, I realized I don't want that job. And then I also knew I wasn't getting that job. And like, if I'm not going to get the next job up. And even if I did, I didn't want it. What's next for me? Yeah. So that really started me on the whole journey of the thinking what do I want to do? And it's when I hired my first coach and started kind of on my journey of recognizing what it is that I want to do in the next part of my career. I had no intention to become a coach, uh, but I saw what was happening in the world of human development and, um, you know, realized that I had some assets, that these are things that I had been doing, and then also could invest in learning more skills, more competencies. So that was kind of my catalyst moment, as I call it. Well, that's phenomenal. So I want to, yeah. and anybody just join us, we're here with Darcy Eichenberg, Red Cape Revolution, and just this uh, keynote speaker, workshop extraordinaire, author. We're going to talk, uh, dig into her book. Our topic today are, is going to be stay strategies. Before we get there, Darcy, I want to talk a little bit about like how you make change in your folks. And if you don't, Darcy, if you don't mind, like, sit back for a second, okay? Just Damon, you ready? You ready for this? Ready okay. for it. Like if I, if I read everything, if I shared everything that I read, like we would be here for an hour, but just, here's a few things that people say about Darcy. Okay. I moved past fear faster. Thanks to Darcy. There's dozens. And if you go on guys, you want to connect with Darcy on LinkedIn, please do so. You'll thank Damon and I later warm, engaging, fantastic sense of humor, passion. Like it's just over and over in these testimonials. I'm really impressed with somebody within 10 minutes of speaking. I listened to Darcy for four 
hours. That was like this. This is a quote that somebody said on LinkedIn. Emotional intelligence is next level. She presented at the Kellogg and alumni enthusiastic, clearly knows her stuff, dropped aha moments. Career coaching with Darcy is like having co- coffee with your closest friend, energy, strategic coach, coach who asked the tough questions. And people said that multiple times. And lastly, Darcy taught me how to be a mentor. Darcy, my goodness gracious. They out, I saw wow. blind spot remover was another comment that I saw of yours. How yeah, male, I, I mean, uh, no, that, that's very kind. And I'm very proud of the work that, uh, that, that I've done, but I, I think I'm more interested in really, you know, where are we going and the yeah, problems yeah. and things that we have the opportunity to solve and, uh, you know, and, 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 and it's great to create results that people talk about. Right. Um, and yeah, I think we're all still challenged that, you know, there's, there's more, there's more to do. So I'm always wow. glad to be with people like you all who want to, you know, keep moving forward. So how do you, so how do you help somebody? Uh, we're going to get into the state strategies in a minute. I just like say something like Damon, we have a number of friends, colleagues here that we talk to, you know, and again, working at manufacturers, maybe they feel a little bit stuck or maybe, you know, COVID really threw them a, an awful curveball that, you know, COVID through, you know, it's hard to find anybody that COVID didn't throw a curveball at. So, you know, wherever somebody is at in life, you know, just with these just great raving testimonies, I appreciate your humility. And I just wanted to just share my admiration, my respect, and just, you know, just off the charts of what you've done, you know, changing people's lives. If somebody is stuck, just, you know, could just take us there for a minute. Like, what are just some, I want to say simple strategies, but what are some helpful strategies that people could just start taking that one step forward to get unstuck? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So first of all, I think once you recognize that you're stuck, one of the challenges that I think happens is that we 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 get caught in the swirl. Mm-hmm. And you, me, Damon, we work, we work with a lot of smart people. And the challenge with this is that a smart person says to themselves when they're stuck, I should be able to figure this right. out. Oh, I just I have once the deadline is passed, once the kids get out of school, once the uh, economy flattens out once, you know, and we stay in this world of being stuck instead of making at least one decision. And I think sometimes, sometimes the decision, and this is, of course, I'm biased is to get, uh, to get a coach, to talk to a friend, to have a mentor, because we can't see the label from inside the jar, right? We're in our own swirl. We're believing our own stories. And so having somebody else who can kind of look at what you're doing, and often that's the first place that, you know, someone will graciously introduce a friend to me or to introduce them to some of my content. And I think first recognizing that you actually control only three things. You control what you think, what you say, and what you do. And when you recognize that is all that is in your control, you can get out of the swirl a little faster and start moving into action. Mm -hmm. But that's really one of the first things is recognize you're in the swirl and then understand what you have control over and what you don't. Perfect. Okay. So thank you. That was very powerful. Let's slide into stay strategies. So now what we're talking about is like, how do we, how do we stop this turnover, this crazy yeah. turnover that's going on? And you've just really been doing an amazing job helping employers and just trying to figure out that whole strategy. Take us there. What are some tips, strategies that you have for folks as, as far as the stay strategy? Yeah. Well, so I think, you know, we think about stemming the tide of turnover in general. Mm-hmm. First, I do think it starts with, you know, are we taking control of what we think because a lot of leaders I talk to are throwing up their hands and they're like oh, you know this is just inevitable it's just the mindset of the moment uh, there's absolutely nothing that I can do or I've done everything that I can right and often the things that we're thinking about that we've done um, it, you have to do with with traditional solutions, pay, benefits. And of course, pay has to be equitable, right? We have to have done our work. Our company has to have done our work to say, how are we bringing pay up to the, you know, to levels that are fair and equivalent to the value that the roles are creating? So none of these strategies are ways to, to, underpay or undervalue your people, right? There's a there's a, a baseline first of doing good work. Yeah. Um, beyond that, 
I think the, the, the three elements that make up the state strategies programs and it, it gets implemented a little differently for each company, but starts with clarity. Mm. What is, what does our team want? What do our people want? Often I think we are making these blanket assumptions um, and we haven't really done the homework to understand where the differences might lie. Uh, what might just be the loudest voice in the room that's actually not representative of the whole. And, you know, we've seen this a lot coming out of coming out of COVID, coming out of just, you know, just stages of of disruption that it's easier to make a blanket assumption. It's easier just to say, well, everybody wants more of this. Everybody wants more time off. So we're going to give them more time off or everybody wants hybrid work. So we're going to give them hybrid work, but doing the work to get the clarity. And this is on both sides too. It's also the clarity for the person, the, the you know, your team to understand what the business needs. You know, I feel like in the past few years, we've lost a lot of business acumen. And this is actually a piece that is, uh, there's a differential between people moving up or not. Do they understand not just what we make, but how what we make makes a difference, how what we make makes something better. And especially in industries where it's a B2B industry, Damien, you, I'm, I know you work with a lot of those types of groups as opposed to, you know, we're making pots and pans or we're making clothes, right. but, you know, we're making a widget that goes with, 50 other widgets to make a car. I mean, right. those are more complex business conversations. The clarity on that, I think, is super important. So that's one aspect of, uh, of, of the state strategies that when we're working, we work both with the teams and the leaders to make sure both sides have clarity about what's most important. So that's one aspect. I'll stop yeah, there for yeah. a second. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I, you, you are hitting the nail on the head because... If you don't, if you're guessing at what your people want, you're probably wrong, first of all. And it, it takes a different approach, right? Because we, we're we dealing with a multi-generational environment. People like me, we don't, we're the, we're the, the older generation, right? We, we didn't have leaders that were sharing a larger purpose, a larger vision. But as you go into the next generation's, younger than than people like me, that is becomes more and more important and leaders need to to change how they're leading and uh, soliciting that that input because it's so critical it's just it, it's it's one of the things that i think you touched on and really it drives it home for me is you need to understand what your people really want because it's not just money it's a sense of purpose it's there's there's so many other things around it that that you know, I think that ties in. I didn't read the entire question. Let's pull up. Let's hit Tina. Yeah, we'll right now. I, I think, think, I think that I think what I skimmed it real quick. I think so. My clients are fearful for certain employees leaving and they seem to be becoming weak leaders. I see them not wanting to leave the uh, courageous conversations. Great. They need to have. What advice would you give a leader who is fearful and beginning to let their employees run the roost? Tina, thank you. Excellent question. Darcy, what do you think about that? Yeah. So I think, first of all, when we sense as maybe a leader of leaders that we've got leaders that are giving up, that are kind of throwing their hands up and saying, huh, this is just the world right now. Those people, they want everything or these quote unquote kids today or this older generation. I've seen it actually happen on both sides. Right. Uh, so I think, first of all, it's it's worth challenging the leader to to replace that frustration with empathy. Mm. So what I mean by that is to recognize that when we are approaching a situation where we're making up the story and we're not just assuming positive intent, assuming that if this person, if, if something's not working for this person, then like, then I want to know why I want to dig into the clarity. I want to understand instead of being just frustrated at the situation mm -hmm. and giving up. And then to the point about the question, I, you know, looking at more of the details of the question. Um, but I think the leader who is starting to get fearful also has to recognize all that they can control are the three things, what they think, what they say, and what they do. Mm -hmm. 
And you as their leader, a leader of leaders, has to recognize that it's not in complete control that somebody stay. But has somebody done things? Are there ways they can think differently about this person? Instead of thinking, you know, having the mindset this person is, oh, they're just always going to be a troublemaker or they're just always going to ask for more. Um, they're never going to be happy here. So I'm just not even going to pay attention to them. You know, that's a thought, right? Or what can I say? Am I saying, I want you to stay? You are valuable here. You know, what do we need to do together to make this experience the one that you want, no matter when you move on? But even engaging in those kind of conversations. And then, you know, what you do. I think when we have avoidance behavior, that sends a message, right? And it's just, you know, we're all, humans are messy. And yeah. recognize that sometimes people are doing things, and I've seen this as the, some post-COVID behavior, um, doing behavior that doesn't actually serve them, but they've just gotten into the habit, like phoning in for meetings and multitasking instead of being present if yeah, it's an yeah. online meeting. Yeah. Uh, we've got to call people out on that. And we, it doesn't have to be in a mean or judgmental way. Uh, it's just a... It's a mirror, right? I'm I'm making an observation that you're checked out during the weekly status meeting. Right. Is there something else going on here? Or or to be direct, I'd like you to really I'd like to make sure that meeting has your input. Right. Can you know we make some adjustments? Right. And you know, the chances are when you when you call someone out honestly with empathy, not frustration, yeah, oftentimes they're gonna be like yeah, you're right. You caught me on my crap. And, you know, they may not say that, but right. they just know where you stand and what you want. Right. Uh, yeah. I absolutely, absolutely love that. That's so think. awesome. So awesome. Because I was just, I was just talking with a client about this and, and we don't deal with individuals as much as we do with the, the owners of the business doing it, but same to her very question here. We, we use a lot of EOS kind of, you know, you have to know, is this the right place for this person at this time in their career? Mm -hmm. And, and as businesses change, people will leave businesses just because it's not a good fit for them. And there's nothing you can do as a, a leader of an organization to change that. But having the hard conversations like you're talking about understanding and with empathy, like you said, not frustrated that it's not working out, but just being honest and open about it. I mean, is it the right place for them now? Are they just simply not happy because the role has had to change or the business and the industry has changed or something like that? That is a time, I think, to celebrate the fact that and help them get to where that is better for them personally. And they can help you make sure that the transition is is not abrupt or ugly. If you if because if you avoid the conversation, we know what's going to happen. They're just going to say, ah, here's my my notice and I'm gone. Right. Right. And the unexpected departure is always more painful than the one where we're being honest and we know, OK, this life cycle of this particular thing is going to come to an end. How do we close out a relationship with grace and respect? And, you know, again, not everybody can do that. And that certainly doesn't always happen in a business. But one of the other things that um, that uh, you said, Damon, you know, that I'll often talk to groups and remind them that our work is all made up. And even when we know a role in a factory or a role in a business management uh, has to have certain aspects of it, when we're not really understanding and not having the clarity of what that, of what the people, our people need or an individual needs, we also cut off the opportunity for them to think about the bigger business and think about other places where they might fit in. And sometimes, yes, people out of the role or the pain that that job solved gets solved. And so there's no need for the role anymore. I mean, every open job is just a problem to be solved, right? And often we solve problems. We implement new technology. We, um, we have a different client who needs different things, a different customer. But when we also can invite our people to say, how do you use what you want to do more of? How do you use what you bring for some of our bigger business problems? We get to make up different things that 
help keep our people and that institutional knowledge uh, without, you know, all that knowledge walking out the door. Yeah, I absolutely love that. So, Darcy, let's go here. So you, uh, I have down, you mentioned clarity is number one. Then you wanted to pause as we were talking about the state strategies. Do we want to pick up from there? Do, is there is there a number two? I feel like I'm on a cliffhanger. Is there a number two waiting there for us? Yes, there's two and three. So the nice. second the second one is connection. I think we talked about this a little bit. I mean, this is a basic human need. And I think it was magnified by the experiences that people had during COVID. But, you know, belonging is critical to humans and feeling connected to something. And, you know, Gallup's classic data of people leaving managers and, you know, not leaving companies. And also uh, they had recent data that showed the, um, the presence of a best friend at work has actually declined. And that's actually a motivator for people to stay. If I feel like I'm seen, if I feel like I belong. Mm. Um, and these things can feel a little squishy sometimes, but I also think there's, uh, I mean, first of all, we all experience it in ourselves, right? We know the groups where we felt like we've belonged, where we feel safe. Mm. This goes back to the brain science that the brain wants that feeling of certainty and safety our world doesn't provide that, but the people who know, like, and trust us can provide it. So as the employer, how can you accelerate connection? You know, I, I call it creating collisions sometimes. And there's maybe strategies like I teach um, in some companies what we call retention roundtables. And they are managers from across the company that come together, in some cases, once a month, some cases once every two weeks, mm -hmm. and cross pollinate. What's happening for them? What are the ideas? Um, what's working? Where are they struggling? And it's fascinating to these people who don't get an opportunity in their normal work mm -hmm. to connect and collaborate, to create a construct where they get permission to come together, they get safety to talk about these things. So they're often facilitated by an external coach. So it's a safe place to say, you know, I don't know what to do about, about this. Here's my scenario. And to have others in the same company be able to support them, be able to share strategies and connect them with different types of opportunities. And these retention roundtables can be um, incredibly beneficial to create a more tightly knit group of, of a cohort and belonging. And, you know, and so, uh, so that is another aspect of helping people stay is to know that they're connected to something. Absolutely. Love it. So laying out clarity connection. I love, you know, you're talking about, you know, creating that safe environment and especially, you know, uh, the target that we're speaking to small companies, you know, 20 employees, sometimes less, right. Might be five, 10, but you know, uh, there's chances, there's risks. And a lot of people don't want to look like the fool or don't want to, you know, like you were talking about technology earlier, you know, if there's a manufacturer who wants to institute a new ERP system, who's going to take that chance of instituting the wrong ERP system or, you know, hiring the wrong firm or buying the wrong piece of equipment, you know, so so let's take another, uh, and I, I, know, I know we have a cliffhanger. We have number three coming up, but get, get, take us one step further. I'd love to hear for that small manufacturer, that small entrepreneur out there. How do you, you know, we're, you know, like you said, he gets a little squishy. I think it was a word that you wrote down. You know, how do you create that safe environment to, you know, like we're going to make mistakes. We're human. We're just going to make mistakes, but how can we do it together as a, a team and really create that firm connection? Yeah. So one of the things that I think is a strategy anybody can implement right now is even with a small team. So let's say that you have 20 people, you know, in, on, on your team. And even if they're physically co-located and you think, I know everything about what's going on with that person. Mm -hmm. Chances are every time you have a meeting, you start with all the stuff that's undone or all the stuff that's wrong. And what you don't do is take the time to acknowledge what's right or what's happened. Or one of the things I love to do to kind of like just change the tenor of the conversation wow. um, is to, okay, 30 seconds. What's one thing you're proud of that's happened in the past week? And anything that was tied to your KPIs or it doesn't have to be. No one else may even know about it. And every time that I've had the opportunity to be in the room and facilitate these conversations as leaders are like building their muscle as to how to do this, how to 
slow down to speed up, you know, how to slow down the meeting to talk about other things before we get into the juice of what we're together here today to talk about. Um, they always find something they didn't know. And they think, you know, I've known Randy for 12 years and I didn't realize that that's the kind of thing that really, you know, gets him excited, that lights him up. Um, because when we invite people to say something where they can't be wrong, what's, what's the biggest thing you're proud of in this past week? Yeah. It can't be wrong. If I said, I'm proud of staying out of the argument with the customer who was really getting grouchy, like you, right. they, you can't be wrong right. you're out of it. It's, you know, but it's revealing. Right. It's super revealing. That's awesome. Darcy. We, so on our program, we have these little things called moments of silence. Yeah. So we just want everybody, you know, it's it's lunchtime here in the east eastern time zone. So we just want to savor that. Just what a great, brilliant piece of, I you know what I'm embarrassed. Like I, I'm 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 guilty as charged, man. Hey, what are we gonna fix today? I'm the fixer. What are we gonna fix? Brilliant. And you're not alone because I mean, as leaders, that's how we became leaders, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. not, you know, yeah. stuff done. Yeah. Uh, and. It, we have to recognize that in our world of talent today, we're trying to you know stem the tide of turnover. Uh, we've got to hit the reset button yep. and we've got to reconnect with people in different ways. And sometimes that is that we have to slow down to speed up, that we have to take that step back in order to be able to go forward faster. And, you know, I worry that we don't always teach that, you know, because these are these are some basic people and relationship skills. Um, but they're also how to be able to balance it in ways that can scale, that you can do things like that with a team and build those habits. And you know, it's working when it starts to mirror back when other people start to do that, when they start to do it in, in their teams and they take just a, you know, just a few minutes. And mm -hmm. again, you know, we've all got one of these, right? Where we can time stuff right, today right. and, and it doesn't have to be a big, you know, right. going on. Oh, if I if I get it started, then you know Susan will never stop talking. It's like no, you got a you got a buzzer, you got a timer. It's gonna ding. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, Darcy, how about this comment here? A little little mic drop moment for you. How's that one? So, hey, Tina's here. She says she loves the comments about the safe collaboration. Our dear friend, our our boy, our mastermind partners are here supporting us, giving us love. I love love like the idea of retention roundtables. And I see Tina has another question. Now, you know what? let's take the question. I'll leave a little cliffhanger because if I'm not I'm not a mathematician or a math major, Darcy, but I think we're still hanging on to number yeah, three. Number three yeah. I'm not mistaken, right? So guys, you're gonna have to hang out for number three, but we've got a question for Darcy. I find that CEOs and exec leaders want cost to the cost to the pain so they can find a reason to embrace these growing changes. What are the costs to not creating a squishy opportunity or the costs of not having the courageous conversations? Wow, Tina. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great question. This is actually something I've been doing more research and looking at some different ways to talk about this. So certainly there are ways that, you know, our, we've long looked at what the cost of turnover is in terms yeah. of what's the cost of rehiring, what's the cost of retraining. But I actually am really interested in being able to figure what's the cost to the leader? Because, you know, we talk about, you know, leaders and teams as if they were entities with one single brain, but you know, it comes down to a person, like a company, like companies don't make decisions, people, a person makes the decision. They might lead a decision collectively with other leaders, but so what's the cost to you as a leader? So some of the math that I've been playing with, and we're actually trying to figure out a calculator for this. So anybody who's like a great calculator maker, you know, come to me on LinkedIn. Um, but is the cost of, first of all, there's your salary. And then, you know, what's the cost of your hour? And what's the opportunity cost of a lost hour? Because if someone's leaving your team, that costs you time. What's the cost of your stress? What And then, then being able to trickle that down to, if you magnify, you say, I have five leaders of leaders, and they're all paid at $150,000. And if it even costs them 
seven hours in a month, what is that cost to the organization? So I think sometimes coming back to not only thinking about the cost from a salary perspective, um, but also the cost for like, what is the cost of stress? What would you pay to have less stress about are you going to have enough people to get that client deliverable done? Um, these things are value judgments. And ultimately, that's what we pay for, right? We pay for value. Uh, we don't pay for things. We pay for the value we associate for the things. Uh, oh my yeah. Okay. Well, um, guys, I dropped. So I, I want to be mindful of time, Darcy. I, so if, if you can hang out with us for a couple more minutes, because I know we're coming into time, but we, we, we have. Yeah. I've done, if you need to run, if you have another meeting, we are here with Darcy. I can very strongly encourage you, invite you, welcome you. I implore you, connect with Darcy here on LinkedIn. I dropped her website in the chat box. You can, you're just. Damon, I'm, this may be the fastest yeah. program yeah. I've ever had. Just put the clock in my head. 40 minutes in. I wasn't even going to Darcy has free tools on her website. She has courses. She has classes. She's a, just a powerhouse speaker. She has a book. I'm going to drop the book in the chat box in one second, Darcy. Can we, are we ready for well, number three? Are we ready? I, I got one thing because you touched on something and Michael just hit it. And this is. Just think, and we talk about setting the tide and turnover. If you have high turnover, who is saying? Mm -hmm. That's a bigger challenge, I think, in business than, than people even measure at all. Right. Because it's it's like, who is staying? Right. What, right. what happens when you lose the rock star, right? Yeah, what, what happens when you lose what, the rock star, like Michael said. It's like you, you, you lose your – if it's just – if you have high turnover, who is staying? Well, and one of the things that we often do in the clarity stage of the state strategies is to also uh, identify who are the most important people. Because you yeah, love everybody, we want everybody to stay, but some people have ripple effects more than others. And, you know, we only have a finite amount of time in our day and our energy. And so saying, okay, I see where the, not only the formal reporting relationships are, but those informal circles, the reverberations. And to know that if I can just target time and attention and some of these strategies to these five people, um, does that actually create more result for me? Um, and to teach them these strategies, which actually, and I'll, I'll just, I'll go to it, Kurt. You know, the third strategy, it's part of what I call the state strategies, is this idea of control, mm -hmm. of both understanding when we talked about the, sort of the top of our time, what you control and what you don't. And we only control those three things, what we think, what we say, and what we do. But we can also teach people that they control those things too. And so people who aren't speaking up when something is going wonky or that's just like not or, or a decision gets made and it lands on them a different way. The people who are, who are not feeling that they can actually say, uh, hey, when you promoted when you promoted Damon over me, like that sent a message to me. Help me understand mm -hmm. what you really meant there and what that means to me. Mm -hmm. We've got to teach people how to take control. Um, and that's part of what my book is about, of giving you the tools where you can take control in many ways for yourself. <sighs> it's hard. Darcy, it's hard to follow you. you know, right? So all right, I dropped Darcy's book uh, in the in the chat box and yep. just, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of five star reviews. Darcy, you, you have a great testimonial from Daniel Pink. You have our dear uh, testimonial from our dear friend Dory Clark, and so guys, strongly encourage you, invite you, welcome you. Grab, uh, grab Darcy's book. It is just a phenomenal read, and as you're just getting a small taste, Darcy, I know uh, you are a busy person, and I don't want to be. I don't want. I could keep you just like that one gentleman said. She she kept my attention for four hours. You you just yeah. really truly have a gift. 
Oh. He's a leader in a, ma in a large manufacturing uh, company. So uh, well, you, you, know, you know exactly who I'm talking about, right? His name is Keith, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. That uh -huh. right? my, my, my power door, an awesome company in Southwest Florida, growing super fast all over the country. Yeah. Uh -huh. Awesome. Perfect. So as we start winding down, well, here's here's one question I want. Okay, you work with all sorts of different manufacturers, not different industries, different companies, some manufacturers, as, as you said. Now. I'm going to, I'm going to get, I know Damon, we goof around a lot. I'm going to get real serious now. Darcy, you ready? I'm going to get real serious. When you're working with a company, you just, you just that aha moment comes, you see the team change. You see that, per, you know, again, you're very humble and I hope I didn't embarrass you with some of those wonderful raving comments. When you just have just a wonderful celebration, Damon, you used that word celebrate earlier. I love that word celebrate. When you have a celebration, when somebody just has that clarity, they gain control, they have that connection all your three C's that you're talking about. What Bruce Springsteen song are you breaking out to celebrate with? <laughs> That's my question for you. When you are celebrating with a client where you just absolutely crushed it, what is your go-to Bruce song for your client? Uh, it was my go-to Bruce strong. Well, we, it would just be too cliche to say born to run. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. I, but I think when I, if I'm feeling really good about myself, if, if, if you know, if, if it's like, you know, I'm proud of the work that I've done, uh, then it's probably, she's the one, which is an under, she's underplayed, but, uh, highly of a, a song that I, I, I love a lot. So, and anybody under the age of 40, yeah, they're, 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 they're like, who's, who's this Bruce guy? Bruce yeah, Almighty. No we so, we're talking about Bruce Springsteen. So, uh, Darcy and I are big Bruce Springsteen fans. She just went to see Bruce recently. And so, I felt compelled. I ha had to ask you this. So, Whitney, I saw that you dropped a, uh, uh, share that link again. It was a really long link. So, I'm going to drop your book in again. Guys, it's called Red Cape Red You Save Your Career Without Leaving Your Job. And again, Connect That's with Darcy right. on LinkedIn, and you're going to just see like how folk. And, and again, you had a, a gentleman. His name was Hodnett. I think was it Michael Hodnett. Michael Hodnett uh, shared how like he, you helped shine a light to, to him, where like you brought his his aspirations, his goals came true, and never had to leave his job. So I love these tactics and these strategies that you're bringing to folks. As we're winding down, we mentioned connect with you on your website. You have free tools. You have courses. Can you share with uh, you have a wonderful community? Can you just share with the folks about your community that you have and how you help folks? Yeah, definitely redcapeinsider.com. If you have any trouble with that, because sometimes firewalls get wonky, just you know connect with me on LinkedIn. But every week I I have what I call my insider community, totally free. That's where I share little stories, encouragement, uh, tips, tricks, just things that are coming up from the world of work that I'm observing, you know, with the great fortune that I have to be able to see things through many different under angle, other angles. So signing up for my insider community, it's a great way to keep in touch. I also encourage people who are in there to email me back and send a question or a comment. And so it's also a way that we, you know, stay in closer touch. And then also I get to hear from many of you all over the world. Absolutely. So, hey, boy, just a lot of great positive comments. Yeah. And, and just, you know, Tina, of course, our, our colleagues, our friends with the mastermind, Whitney's dropping great comments. We have a bunch of other folks here. Darcy, as we wind down, my last question for you, I opened up with who was your hero? We talked about Jack, your wonderful, amazing dad. He's shining a bright light right on you today. And of course, grandpa and just all these wonderful folks in your family that elevated you. You're sharing your gifts and talents with folks in your world. 2023, man, we're like, we're already halfway through February. Who or what is your inspiration today? As we're moving forward, you're helping folks with a stay strategy. You have this amazing book. You're helping folks all over the country. Who or what is your inspiration today that keeps you motivated? So I think it's a what that is my mantra that somebody out there needs me. Yeah. And that's the mantra that keeps me going when it gets hard or keeps me coming, uh, you know, out to situations like this when I could probably put my foot in the mat, my mouth or do something goofy. Um, but somebody out there needs me. I may not know ever what the one somebody is until they have the courage to reach out or use some of my content or buy my book or those sorts of things. But, but I trust in that somebody out there needs me. And I, I offer that to anybody who's ever felt like, are they holding back? Are they not trying some different things? Are they not working in a different way that 
you know, helps retain their people or grow their team. Um, somebody needs you and you just may not know what it is they need. You just got to be out there trying it and doing it. Man, this is so good. <laughs> it's incredible. First, I want to thank you. You have really yeah. played it safe. You could have kept your wonderful, incredible yeah. corporate career and you could have just, yeah. you know, ro- and had a wonderful career doing that. And right. And instead you took the, you had the courage, you took that leap of faith, you threw on that entrepreneurial hat and just, you're just an incredible, wonderful coach helping all sorts of folks and what a gift and what a blessing you are to all of us this past, whatever time it's been, has been just so I've, I'm just at a loss of words. I feel so fortunate to be in your world, in your circle. I have a really exciting year ahead uh, working with you and our folks in our, our, our little little mastermind group that we're in, Darcy. So, Damon, we're going to wind down. Darcy, any last words of wisdom, any parting thoughts with everybody? I just want to thank you all for the, the generosity that you put out, not just to me, which, you know, I'm moved and flattered, but also to you all putting all this energy into the world, into your communities. Mm. And I just think the topics you're talking about, uh, as we think about our manufacturing people, we think about, you know, the leaders who are trying to make work work better for everybody. Uh, I think it's so important. And thank you for all the work and the passion gotcha. that you put into it and the support that you uh, offer for people like me all year long. I, I, I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So guys, thank you for joining us today. And just boy, what a, what, what a blessing. That's all I can say. Just what a blessing. And boy, if I hope you were inspired, if you're inspired, grab Darcy's book, check out her website, join her community. Anytime you see Darcy speaking, boy, get in the front row yeah. and just absorb all this brilliance. And get me out to speak. I love coming out. We're, we, we're traveling now, man. I yeah. love coming out she here to the world. He is. Is a powerhouse speaker. So guys, thank you for joining us today. And just like Darcy did, as she just shared, be someone's inspiration. Boy, you just don't know what somebody's going on. As Darcy pointed out through this whole program, we don't know what people are going through. Just be someone's inspiration. Damon, take it away, my friend. Thank you so much. Darcy for being here today. I just the speech just that points and it was it was incredible to be able to talk with you. Um, thanks everyone who was listening, who commented, who come week in week out and and help build this show, build the the community around it because you're helping everyone as as we get to share wonderful people like Darcy uh, and their insights. But. Uh, Appreciate you all. We will be back again next week with another show. Thank you. We're out for now. Have a great weekend. Hang out with us one sec, Darcy.